let's give it up for our next keynote speaker. There we go. I, uh, I, I try, I'm trying to imagine the prompt that went into the AI, uh, generative AI thing here, like do a photo real image of Barry, but make him more muscular, skinnier, better looking, a little bit younger. They definitely got the brief. Unfortunately, I think you're gonna have to deal with the real Barry here for the rest of the uh, presentation. So um, like they said, I uh, serve as the chief experience officer for Merkel in the Americas, but we have teams here in India. And one of the things that I do, obviously, as the CXO, is I stand up teams of designers, of experienced creatives, and think a lot about what we need to do to kind of make these teams successful. And so one of the things that we want to kind of talk about today is one of the fundamental things that I really think about when I'm trying to stand up these successful teams. And I would sort of sum it up probably best uh, with a statement that one of our team members told me a couple of years ago. It sounds a little bit like uh, maybe an insult, but actually I think it's a compliment. She said that working here feels like going to graduate school. And what that really sums up for me is this notion that I think the secret to our success in standing up really great and successful design teams is this notion that working here is like being in a teaching hospital. You are learning on the job, you're constantly learning as you're actually delivering work for clients. And so I think a lot about how do we actually make that happen for people in our design community? How do we actually kind of create that learning environment? So we do a lot of things. One of the things that we really do, and I believe a lot in, is teams. We try to work in very consistent, teams where everyone can learn from each other, they learn how to work together, they can finish each other's sentences, they learn the skills, and they kind of fill in all the gaps with each other. We also believe in meetups. How do we get people from across North America or from India and Brazil to actually spend time together in summits and learn from each other? But with our company, as big as we are, we've kind of recognized that we actually have to have even more programs than that. And so one of the things that we've started to do is a lot of content where we talk with experts in our business. This is a bunch of content that we create that's called Fast Currents that you can find on YouTube, you can find on Instagram. If you can somehow get around the illegal ban here on TikTok, you can find it on TikTok. Um, and what we do is we talk about um, design issues, design opportunities, and basically learn from each other. But even that I don't think was enough. And so what I've started to do and been doing really for the past five plus years is actually reaching out and having a podcast called What Bubbles Up um, that I actually do with Phil Golub, who is uh, one of the more senior creatives for Wong Duty, another sponsor here at UX India. Uh, in the Americas, and we talk to experts out there in the world about how they come up with ideas for a living, what's the process they follow, how do they know when an idea is really great. And it started out a little bit as a lark, but we have found it to be one of the most inspirational things, frankly. The lessons that we learn from talking to these experts from every creative field around the world. We talk to actors, we talk to artists, we talk to strategists, we talk to experienced designers. The things that we learn, I've really kind of taken to heart and I apply them every day. And so really what I want to share with you here for this presentation to kick off the day is, um, oh, the, 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 I forgot I had this slide in here. The secret, the secret that one of the amazing things about having a podcast is, ironically, I can cold call anybody and if I ask them to be on my podcast, they almost always say yes. There's something about having a podcast. People really want to be a part of it. So what we're going to talk about today really is um, the ideas and the lessons 
um, some of the highlights that we've learned from a lot of these fast current sessions, these video conversations with experts, or from a lot of these podcast interviews. So let's dive into it here. There's a bunch of content I want to get through. So this first person um, that we talk to a lot is a guy named Dave Meeker. Dave uh, is a really interesting guy. He does a lot of work with emerging experiences. He is a member of the Meta Global Creative Council, does a lot of work with MIT, is a musician. And so his world is all about trying to keep up with AI, right? And so I asked Dave a little bit in this podcast what it was like recently, and he told me this story. He told me about how the team had gotten really excited about uh, chatbots sort of becoming more generative AI conversational agents, and how they started experimenting with in-world to actually create avatars, so instead of typing in a chatbot conversation, you're actually talking to an avatar. And they got really excited, and then two weeks later, they started to mess around with actually doing generative video. And so this is basically based on a still. We were able to create a video of Pete Stein, who's our global president for Merkel, and we created a chatbot that looks like you're actually talking to a real person, right? And then two weeks later, they discovered this other brand called Hedra, which goes even farther. All of a sudden here, you're able to now posterize kind of an image and do a Banksy-like sort of like avatar experience. And then two weeks later, Mark Zuckerberg with his crazy tan here, he needs to learn how to wear sunglasses better, uh, be, literally this week just posted a video about how there's going to be hundreds of millions, maybe even billions of AI avatars just sort of like running around doing all these things for us. Meanwhile, the amount of LLMs that are like sort of like exploding around the world has become almost like an arms race, so much so that we discovered Poe, which is an LLM to actually help you pick your LLM. Meanwhile, there's a company out there called Friend, which has now created this, uh, this, this AI uh, sort of like amulet that you live that literally is like recreating the plot of the movie Her. Meanwhile, there's a guy who's like trying to figure out how to like make computers smell better, and this is his idea. And then meanwhile, there's, a, there's a, an opportunity now to have a generative AI as a robot on your desk, just sort of like driving around. And so this is like, he sort of says, Barry, this is basically what it's like when I'm trying to advise the company on AI. And this was literally kind of his, his, his expression with all of this pace going on. We feel this every day, but for the people who are really, really in it, it's a whirlwind of change. And a lot of these ideas are crazy, and a lot of these ideas are you sort of like the inkling of something good, but the main thing is that they're coming fast, and as soon as you start to figure something out, there's something else that kind of gets in the way, and so we asked him, like, what is this really, what are the real takeaways from some of this? Because there's also the perspective that even with all of this going on, this may not even be the real stuff that's coming. That if we actually look at the pattern that happened before when the mobile devices were sort of launched, all of the really fantastic experiences, all of the great designed companies that we now think of as probably being the best examples of leveraging mobile devices weren't even invented for several years until afterwards. So if we're gonna follow that same pattern, then it's gonna be a couple of years, frankly, before we even get to the AI stuff. And so the takeaways from the conversation from Dave, to me, are for a long time, we've really built a lot of our business on this idea of benchmarking. We know what good is, we know what great is, we know what not very good is, and so we can talk with our clients about where their gaps are and how to get them to great. I'm not sure we can do that anymore. Things are changing so quickly that really looking backwards to try to help a client understand what they ought to be doing now probably doesn't make sense in a world where every two weeks there's literally a new LLM and literally a new platform. We have to figure out how to design so that people can be very flexible and just adapt to what's going on. The other takeaway for me is that instead of waiting for, okay, what is, we're finally gonna settle, what's gonna be the next best thing? I actually think that we're gonna have a million next best things. And that 
instead of waiting for like the one platform to win or the one sort of like idea to win and then we can all design around that, I think we are in a world right now where we have to design assuming there's going to be millions and millions of interesting ways to take advantage of things because of the democratization that generative AI provides us. Anyone, basically, not just the big companies, can come up with these incredible ideas that we can design for. Another conversation we had was with a gentleman named Peter Merholtz. Peter is a really interesting guy. He was one of the founders of Adaptive Path. Uh, he's written a book on org design for design orgs. And this is the, uh, my favorite thing about him. He is literally the guy who invented the word blog, which is very cool. And he's got a very radical sort of like conversation that he has with people who are in the design world right now. He basically says, look, Right now, we are in the in-between, and it feels weird to be a designer right now because the way things used to be is definitely gone, but the way things are going to be is also definitely not here yet, and we are sort of stuck in this in-between. And we see this, I think, with all of the designers who are out there who maybe are struggling to get jobs because the skills that made them so great before are not necessarily the skills that you're going to need going forward and that the people who are successful right now and the coaching that he gives people who are in the design world is you have to be very comfortable in this ambiguity, that we are in this in-between phase and you have to not sort of like be waiting and relying on your old skills. You have to be sort of flexible and almost like reinventing what it means to be a designer here these days. The second thing that he talked about is because of this liminal phase that we're in right now, he says that there's a necessary process that designers need to go through right now that he calls ego death, which is basically you need to let go of your sort of self-identity of who you were as a designer, that you were all about the craft, that this is what really made you special, is the fact that you had incredible taste, and you actually have to just simply focus on anything you can do to make impact, including many things that may not necessarily be incredible design or may not necessarily be incredibly beautiful. That if you are willing to kind of have this conversation with yourself and let your sort of self-identity go, that you're actually going to find new ways to add value and be impactful as a designer because the other thing that he's really talking about right now is this huge shift from design to product. That designers need to embrace this notion that the craft is not the only thing that matters anymore, that you have to have a product mindset, you have to embrace and really advocate for the business value of the things that we do, and you need to think about yourself as a part of the business. You need to basically shift from being a creative director or a designer or an experienced designer that talks about design patterns to being someone who really is a driving force of impact in a business. Another person we talked to is Jen Gray. Jen's a fascinating person. The first part of her career, she worked with Oprah, and she, uh, she also directed and sort of helped make Bill Nye the science guy famous. I don't know if that, that resonates here, but these are like big sort of like talk show celebrities and things like that in the US. Um, and she basically has come up in the world of promotions. In fact, she is the proud owner of promotions.com, which has got to be a valuable website. And a couple of things that came out of the conversation with Jen is this notion that, look, all of this talk about AI and everything is new, it's really helpful sometimes to remind ourselves that artificial intelligence is really quite old, right? That's what drove Ms. Pac-Man and Galaga and a lot of these things. AI has kind of been around for a while. And if we think about it from that perspective, the things that we loved about it back then was the sense of joy that it gave us, right? The sense of sort of like delight and like the inventiveness. And she really tries to talk with her teams about how sort of embracing that aspect, not only thinking about it as an efficiency play, but actually as a way to kind of create delight and joy. She also really likes to look at any kind of experience, any kind of design, any kind of product that she and her team make really as a game because she believes that game theory drives everything and game theory is actually the secret 
to high performance. For example, she talks a lot about white hat, black hat theory. White hat theory is basically if I offer you a free gift, if you do something, maybe you're going to do it. Black hat theory is I actually take something away if you don't do it. And what's so interesting is that black hat theory actually drives far more behavior than white hat theory. It's why people are so desperate to keep their streaks alive on Snapchat, on Peloton. This notion of losing something and sort of avoiding that is actually more powerful and motivating than getting something for free. And so a lot of this game theory tends to get applied in promotions, but we're seeing more and more applications of how to bring this into financial services and insurance, filling out forms. How can we sort of like use white hat theory and black hat theory to actually get people to finish filling out that application? The other thing that Jen talks a lot about, which is really interesting in the business that we're in, is around how the best customer is the customer you already have. She laments the amount of time and energy that we spend designing things for new people. She thinks it's a waste of time, that in fact, if you design things for your current customers and you make your service, your product, your experience so invaluable for them that it becomes a part of their lives, they turn into fans. Right? And what do fans do? Fans basically like walk around basically as an advertisement for your business, for your brand, and those current customers will get you new customers. Another group that we talked to here is a combination of Courtney Trudeau and Sunil Rao. These are two folks who are basically data scientists and analytics folks and technologists. And they're not what you would necessarily call creative people, but I would argue with the way that data is now informing design and actually driving so much of our design, they are secretly some of the most creative people in our business. And what we talked a lot about is that something that we've all observed, which is sort of this, this alpha theme that big business has lost its way. And what do we mean by that? What we mean is anytime we're talking about a design project with a really large company, and we probably all had these conversations, it usually starts with, oh, I need a new website, I need a new app. And you go, why? And they're like, well, because the one we have is old. Okay, but why do you need this new thing? Well, because I have to spend the money this year or it's going to go away. Okay, but why do you need this thing? And you have this circular conversation where you kind of realize that these clients in these big companies don't even understand why these experiences exist in the first place, right? They basically need to go back to thinking and behaving like they did when they were a startup, right? The thing that made them so successful when they first started is they had a service or they had an offering that solved a customer problem and became essential, right? They built their entire business around solving a problem and as they get successful, Suddenly they start creating divisions in their business. They start buying other companies. They start like doing projects just because there's like a finance flow and they literally become disconnected from the reason these things exist in the first place. And so the opportunity here really from our perspective is anytime you're designing something for a client, it could be an app, it could be a website, it could be any kind of a digital experience, it isn't actually transforming that experience. It's an opportunity to talk about their business. The taxonomy on a website is an opportunity to actually talk about how that company should be organized to better serve the customer, not a reflection of how the current company is organized. And if you do that, then you actually can transition any of these small design projects into digital business transformation. The other thing that we talk about, completely different subject, is we love to run around and talk about human-centric design, involving customers in the design process, sort of like really taking into account those human needs. Well, what are we going to do when, in the future, we predict that between a third and half of all online commerce experiences are actually machine-to-machine? -machine? There's no human involved at all. All of the way that we have sort of informed our design process has really been around 
showing it to people, getting their opinion, how do they feel about it. In machine-to-machine -machine commerce, we're going to have to come up with a whole new system and a whole new metric because these, <laughs> these machines are not going to feel anything. What they are going to do is they're going to act a certain way. And so human-centric design has to evolve, too. Donald Chestnut's another person we talked to. Donald's a really legendary experience designer. He has served as the global chief experience designer uh, uh, officer for General Motors, for MasterCard. Um, he's, he basically was a disciple of Clement Mock back in the early days with, with Studio Archetype. Donald had a bunch of really interesting, almost humbling things to say. One of the things that he likes to talk about is that great experience design gets taken for granted. Gets taken for granted. The thing that, what he means by that is he sort of tells this story about he can remember the day, the very first time with a mobile device, he was walking on the street in New York City and he, on his phone, found a movie theater, bought a movie ticket, sort of made the reservation, and it was like amazing. Amazing. Now it's completely ordinary. It's just the way that you do these things. And that's actually the secret of great experience design. It is if you do it really, really well, it basically, you almost don't even realize it's there. It's just the service that you kind of appreciate. It's just the product. It's what's so different about experience design than marketing design, which is desperately trying to get you to notice the design. If you do experience design really well, service design really well, you literally don't notice it. The other thing that he talks about is, again, getting back to some of these conversational agents, that um, they did a bunch of experiments as they started to build out conversational agents at General Motors, transitioning from something that looked like a sort of a conversational chatbot to something where you actually are talking to an avatar like an actual human. And what he noticed is when you would type in a prompt in the chat bot and you get those three dots like the computer is waiting basically to respond, people were fine with it. But when you're actually staring at a human face and you get the same amount of delay, people hated it. They hated it. And what it's an example of is that the number one thing you really need to understand moving forward here as a designer is human psychology. That basically the barrier to creating things is no longer technology. The barrier really is more around human acceptance. And so even though we can put an avatar on there, it actually changes the human perception of that, what that experience should be and it makes them more annoyed that they have to wait for a response. The final thing that he likes to talk about really is that he is in awe of the people that he works around. He does not think of himself as the talent, this guy who has designed everything and done, had these global roles. He really thinks of himself a little bit as the ringmaster in a circus, the curator of talent, and that his entire job as a design leader is trying to figure out the best way to have all of this talent work together to do something spectacular. Final person here, Tracy Wong. Tracy is in the Clio Hall of Fame. He is the founder of Wong Duty. He put the Wong in the duty, as, as I think Phil would say. And uh, he's a fascinating uh, designer, basically. And what Tracy likes to talk about is how to kind of come up with ideas. And what he likes to say a lot of the time is that the best way to find an idea is to just let go. We actually heard this if any of you were in the, or, or, or watched the, uh, the Design Women panel yesterday, one of the participants talked about sometimes she just takes a nap and then she wakes up and she actually has a great idea. It's all about the incredible power of subconscious, of distraction. And Tracy talks about how he encourages his design team to not just sit there and grind away forever, to get up, to go walk in a park, to get up, to go see a movie, to find some distraction, to kind of sleep on it, and that his experience over and over again has been that actually allows the brain subconscious to work and for you to actually kind of find ideas faster. The other thing Tracy talked a lot about is 
what makes really high performance teams. So Google did a big study called Project Aristotle trying to figure out what is the secret to building super high performance teams. Is it hiring people only from elite universities? Is it paying them a lot more money? Is it sort of figuring out uh, who the smartest people are? And the answer was actually really, really simple. It's this notion of do you feel safe and do you feel heard? that the highest performing teams scored the highest on those two metrics. So people who were from less fancy universities, people who theoretically weren't as smart as other people, those teams would actually outperform other teams that were higher in those metrics if they felt like they were a team, if they felt like they were safe to kind of be themselves, express ideas, and if they felt like their boss heard them. And this is really, I think, the notion that's driving a book that he is pulling out really soon around this notion of creative democracy. It's all about this sort of like, as a design leader, remembering what it's like to work for someone. Having this sense of empathy, like remembering what it is like, and sort of making the whole process what he calls idea-centric and not egocentric. So, as I kind of wrap up here, you know, what is, what's the big lesson? Um, I would sort of say, like, I kind of think about three things here. That all of this, all of this sort of, like, advice, I think, really helps me think about the way we should be building teams, the way we should be building process. But ultimately, what it does is it reminds me over and over again that the experience really matters. It matters from a brand perspective. This is one of my old bosses here, Lee Clow, who was one of the stars of Shia Day, TBWA Shia Day, and he used to always say, a brand is a promise, and the experience is how a brand keeps its promise. He would basically say, the Clement Mock would say, the experience is the brand. I would actually say, these days, that keeping your promise is probably the most important thing. If Nike is going to say something about their brand, or Shiseido is going to say something about their brand, or any sort of big business is going to say something about the brand, the kinds of things that we design in the CX community is how those brands really kind of come true and keep their promises. It also really matters, and we know this from a business perspective, if we're really honest with ourselves, 99% of products and services out there are pretty similar to all of their competitive products and services. And the way that you're going to win in the experience economy is by surrounding that product or service with a superior experience. Literally the things that the people in this room do is going to make the difference between a hit product or a hit service and a complete failure. It's not going to be the product or service itself. And then the final thing that I sort of take away is that um, from a global cultural standpoint, the experience really matters. You know, we have the opportunity at Merkel to work globally with teams around the world, including all across India. And being here is really important to us. You know, we, we are here in the largest democracy in the world, uh, in a country that is soon to be the largest country in the world, uh, getting the opportunity to talk to everyone here in this room in the largest CX conference in the world, because we believe that the experienced leaders for tomorrow probably aren't coming from the United States or from Europe. They're actually probably sitting right here in this room and in rooms like this in India that really the future of experience is going to come here. So this is my final slide, I swear. I know I'm over, but a uh, uh, shameless plug. Uh, we'd love to have you all follow us on Instagram and on YouTube. The Fast Currents content is great. I think you'll love it for your communities. And you can subscribe to What Bubbles Up. If you go on, you can find us on Spotify, on, uh, on Apple Podcast. Um, and uh, go ahead and follow me on LinkedIn. So thank you.